Welcome to Lecture 16 in Topology. This one's on topological groups. So let's get into it. So what is a topological group? Um, so a topological group is simply a group um, for which the operations of the group, namely multiplication and inversion, are continuous. So um, if it's helpful, we could use the notation like M as the mapping which takes g comma h and sends it to g times h. Here I'm assuming, of course, that we're look, looking at a multiplicative group and we're using the you know, juxtaposition notation for the operation. And then uh, in that world of notation, the inverse is, of course, just the multiplicative inverse. I will say that if we had an additive group, instead of having multiplication, we'd have addition. This wouldn't be g times h would be g plus h, and this would be negation rather than inversion, right? So with that understanding, you know, we can have additive groups, we can have multiplicative groups, and um, if the group operations, in either case, are continuous um, with respect to whatever topological structure we're giving to G, then it's said to be a topological group. So, um, so there are many interesting topological groups, and um, one of the chief uh, features of a topological group is the existence of left and right multiplication maps. So in particular, if H is in G, you can talk about right multiplication by H, which just means multiply on the right by H. That defines the mapping X goes to XH. And a left multiplication is defined by multiplying on the left by H. So LH of X is HX. And um, again, we call RH the right multiplication by H map, and LH the left multiplication, left H multiplication map, if you like. So one of the first things you can you can prove about this exciting new world, which is you know combining two things we like, namely topology and abstract algebra, we can prove that in a topological group, the left and right multiplications are homeomorphisms. And here's why. So for fixed H, the mapping um, X. So if we include X into the you know, x comma a, like this, <coughs> x maps to xh, this is a continuous map from g to the Cartesian product of g and g, and if you look at it, right multiplication is the composition of the multiplication map and the inclusion, um, this inclusion, include into h map here, all right? So, and as such, rh is a composite of continuous maps and is thus continuous. Um, here's the how, here's how that formula works. So Rh of x is Mh composed with Ih of x, which is M of x comma h, which is xh. So that's the that's why I can say that it's the composition. Here's the proof, if you will. Now I I will leave the proof that that's a continuous map to you guys, but I think we have proved either that or something close to it in our in our lecture on um, Cartesian products or the product topology. If we haven't proved it, it's not something that would be terribly difficult to prove. But um, this lecture is already pretty long, so let me kind of go on. Now, um, since H is a group, H is an element of a group, we know that there exists an inverse such that, you know, we multiply to the neutral element, as Minetti calls it, or the identity element, as I typically call it. Sometimes if I'm working in multiplicative notation, I'll say E is equal to 1, where it's the, you know, multiplicative identity of the group. But anyway you got ex equals to x equals to xe for all x and g. Moreover, if you look at it, right multiplication by h inverse is this, which is then this, but then the h and the h inverse cancel, because remember group operations are associative, so we can rewrite that as x times h h inverse, which again gives us x times e, which is just x. So lo and behold, the right map, multiplication by map, multiplication by h map has an inverse, in particular, the inverse of the right multiplication map is the multiplication by H inverse map. And um, so not only does it have an inverse, its inverse is, again, an, a map of the same type. And we already know that right multiplication by a group element is continuous. So, and I, I suppose that that's the composition with, you know, the inverse map, if you want to get explicit here. Um, anyway, the point is that the right multiplication by H map is a homeomorphism, meaning it's continuous with... Uh, continuous inverse. Sorry if I was off the off the off the off the map there. All right. And the proof that the left multiplication maps are homeomorphisms is similar. Um, 
probably should have made that a homework, but oh well. Let's see here. So up next, a lemma. So where we're going in this lecture is we're going to talk about some general properties of topological groups, and then we'll shift over to look at matrix groups towards the end, okay? So if you're wondering where we're going. So for any pair, G, H, in a topological group, there exists a homeomorphism which maps G to H. That is, phi of G equals to H. So how do we construct this phi? Um, we just let um, phi either be right multiplication by G inverse H, or you could do size left multiplication by H G inverse. In either, um, either case, it's going to work out. Now there's a little sublemma here that I really should have you know, if I wasn't so lazy and I was was in the mood for rewriting this notes, I would have written the sublemma before the lemma, because really, this is the critical thing, which is that when we compose left multiplication map of A and B, we get left multiplication by AB. But perhaps surprisingly, when you compose um, right multiplication maps, it switches the order of the multiplication like so, which is, I think, part of the reason that, um, at least when I took Lie algebras and Lie groups and stuff, we tend to work more with um, left multiplication maps. So a, a Lie group is, is a topological group that has yet more structure, namely the structure of a smooth space, a space on which you can do calculus, what we call a manifold. Okay, so here's the, anyway, the proof that this and that is true is right here. As you can see, it's just straightforward application of the definition of LA or RA, and there, there it is. And since that holds for all x, this is, you know, gives us an identity for the composition of maps. You know, LA composed with LB is LAB. And um, sometimes I omit the composition symbol and things like this. Um, I guess you could say that in lower level, like undergraduate mathematics, we insist on writing the composition. And it's kind of one of those kind of training wheels things we do in undergraduate math. If you read research mathematics, you'll notice that a lot of times explicit notation of the com the, uh, the composition is left off a lot of places. I tend to write it in my work, but um, I have a penchant for making things look cluttered, so there you go. Anyway, so um, if we have this, it's that, but that is literally the composition of RH and RG inverse. And as such, it's the composition of homeomorphism, which is, again, a homeomorphism. And the same for phi, right? It's, um, and, well, phi, rather, the, the, and this phi maps g to h, and likewise, the psi is the composition of left multiplications, which is, again, a composition of homeomorphisms, and you can see that psi of g maps to h. So you can either work with left maps or you can work with right maps. Either way you slice it, you always have this freedom to map any group element that you like to any other group element that you like by an appropriate composition of left and right multiplications. All right. There is more to say about left and right multiplications, but I'll leave that for another time. Now, um, any group with the discrete topology is a topological group. So which groups can you give? Which sets can you give the discrete topology? The answer is any set. So this means any group. <laughs> can be made into a topological group just by giving it the discrete topology. Um, well, that's, that's, that's lovely, but, you know, if, if, if the group is also something interesting like, you know, mappings of the plane or maybe mappings of R3 or R4 or something like that, this is not that interesting a comment because you're not really interested in continuity with respect to the discrete topology. You're, you're really kind of more interested in continuity with respect to the natural Euclidean topology of the space on which you're working. So while this example is, you know, logically satisfying, it is in practice less useful for the applications I'm interested in anyway. Additive groups, um, where we swap multiplication for addition, um, are important examples. For instance, if we take the, you know, um, Rn or Cn paired with addition and the Euclidean topology, these are topological groups. Um, and then, as I was writing these notes, I was like, well, okay, it shouldn't be hard to prove that addition's continuous. How would you do it? 
So I thought, all right, I'll take a second here. I'll try to prove addition is continuous. This is not in Minetti. He has more sense than I do. So why is addition from Rn cross Rn to N Rn continuous? Well, let's look at it. So the first question is, what's the topology on the Cartesian product of Rn and Rn? Well, it's metrizable. And um, as it explains back in the metric space section, you can build these um, metrics on the Cartesian product of spaces. Uh, Oh, sorry. I don't think I copied the page number down in my notes. Let me find it. I'll tell you where, I'm, where I got this. R really, all this is saying is just put the natural, um, sort of natural Euclidean metric on... This is essentially the natural... This is essentially the Euclidean metric on, like, R2n. If you just string out those two n vectors as one big n vector and use the... Uh, um, so I think the one I'm referencing here is this, page 54... Um, this right here, D2, he's got, you know, you take the Cartesian product distance from here to here, it's the square root of the distance in the x's plus the distance in the y squared. So I'm using this in the context that h and k are both themselves the regular Euclidean um, distance function on Rn and Rn respectively, if you're wondering, which is just a fancy way of saying that I'm using the natural Euclidean metric on Rn cross Rn. This is not the only choice, and really whatever choice you made, um, the topology is equivalent since it's a finite dimensional vector space. Um, any of these metrics that you give um, are, are equivalent. That was proved earlier. But I'm, 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 I'm making a choice. I'm going to use the Euclidean metric just to make things less, you know, weird. And um, so this is the distance formula um, on Rn cross Rn, right that, all right? And so this is how we define distance on x. I'm going to call x Rn cross Rn. And um, then I'm going to look at the function f from x to Rn defined by f of x comma y equal to x plus y. My aim is to prove that this addition map, which I've called f, is continuous. All right, so let's... Let's look at something here. Let me get my... Oh man. Hey, <sighs> Gotta get a bigger table. I guess I'll put that back there. Where was I? Um, okay, so suppose epsilon is greater than zero. Well, first of all, pick a point, x not, y not. Let epsilon be positive uh, number. And let's set delta equal to epsilon over two. All right, and then if I if I consider x comma y in a delta ball about x not y not, right, then I would have the square root of this plus that squared less than epsilon over two. But if you think about it, it implies both this and that are less than epsilon over two, right? Because if either one of these under the square root was larger than epsilon over two, you get a contradiction to what we have right here, right? So clearly, both this component and that component. Um, of x comma y must be less than epsilon over 2. Now, mind you, these are both n-vector lengths, but still, it, it, for all intents and purposes, appears like they're scalars, which is kind of a, kind of a quirky thing about the uh, Euclidean metric in some sense. <coughs> it's got this kind of scaffolding pattern in the formula. But anyway, um, okay, so consider the value of f, then, at such x, y. We have f of x comma y minus f of x not y not, which is x plus y minus x not plus y not. And then I shift around and use the triangle inequality, which is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is less, which is equal to epsilon. Lo and behold, that gives us that, if you look at this, what we've proved is that the inverse image of the epsilon ball centered at f of x not y not is a subset of the delta ball centered at x not y not. And that's true for arbitrary points, and what that essentially can be used to prove is that the inverse image of, well, okay, so to be clear, this is your basic open set in the, um, in the range, right, in, in, in Rn, and um, so you can, let's see here, yeah, your basic open set in the, um, in the range, in, in the codomain, if you will, and this shows that the inverse image of that basic open set is, again, um, contained in a, um, a basic open set in the domain. Anyway, what, it, what, what this gives us is that the inverse image of an open set is open. All right, so this 
being able to prove this will then imply that the inverse image of an open set is open under the, uh, the addition map, and therefore, since x not y not is continuous, we have proved that addition is continuous on x. Now, there may well be more sophisticated, slick ways to prove it, but here's a, at least an attempt at a concrete, explicit argument <laughs> to prove that addition is continuous. <clears throat> All right? Which begs the question, how do you prove other things are continuous, right? Um, it might be more, it might be a little bit more, uh, more subtle, yeah? So I'm not, <laughs> well, hmm, hmm, let's go on. So example three, the general linear group, GLNR, so this is invertible n by n matrices, it's the inverse image under the determinant of the real line with zero deleted. And of course the determinant, as we've discussed before, is continuous, um, because it's multi, it's a, it's a, it's a polynomial in the entries of A, which means essentially it's a, it's a polynomial in the variables in Rn squared. If you look at Rn cross n as Rn squared, it's polynomial in those variables, um, in those Cartesian variables, and as such it's continuous map. I suppose I'm borrowing from some advanced calculus there as I say that. Um, I'm not sure we've kind of built, I don't guess we've built all that up in this course, but fair enough. Um, I mean, to be fussy, you prove the product map is continuous, then you prove the composition map is continuous, and then, like, you can extend to powers, um, and then you, you know, you can prove that, like, the projection maps are continuous, and then you put these things all together, so eventually you got your, work your way up to multivariate polynomials are continuous, and once you have multivariate polynomials are continuous, then you have the determinants continuous, and so forth. So, um, none of these things are terribly difficult to prove, but it, it does take some, some detailed work to really get it all out on paper. Anyway, um, so GLN is the inverse image of um, this, you know, open set, because it's the union of this open ray with that open ray, and since determinant's continuous, the inverse image of a continuous map, of the inverse, continuous inverse image of an open set is open, which means that GLNR is open. All right, and so we can, uh, anyway, we can give GLNR the subspace topology with respect to the usual, usual Euclidean topology on Rn, n by n. And in fact, the mapping, so how do we define multiplication? Um, you know, here's the notation for it. It's not the definition, right? But A matrices, n by n square matrices AB goes to the product of square matrices, which is again square, and as long as the determinant's non-zero, you can invert it. Um, okay, well, that's a little bit vague. How do you actually do that? Well, here's how you do it. The formulas are right here. These are both continuous maps since the formula for matrix multiplication is given by this. Again, it's a polynomial in the coordinates of our n by n, and it's therefore continuous. The formula for the inverse, here's the formula in terms of the classical adjoint. Um, so it's 1 over the determinant times the transpose of the joint. This the joint is formed by a matrix of cofactors with appropriate plus minuses, you know, for the deleted. So you basically you delete rows and columns as appropriate to the entry and take the determinant of what's left over to form this matrix of determinants, essentially, subdeterminants, I suppose. And um, anyway, the formula that I have right here is well known in matrix theory, and you can derive it by Kramer's rule in linear algebra if you're interested. The larger point here is we have rational functions of the coordinates of our n by n, where the denominator is by assumption non-zero, as such a rational function is continuous in its domain, and that continues to be true for multivariate rational functions. So that is why GLNR is a topological group, because matrix multiplication and inversion are continuous maps in this technical sense. It's not obvious that those are continuous maps. I mean, maybe it's obvious, but there is something to prove there. This is the kind of thing Minetti tends to state without a lot of proof. Um, and that's fine, you know, your book, you, you can only say so much in a book that's the length that, you know, it packs a big punch for the length that it is, right? So, anyway. Mm. And perhaps, you know, Perhaps the schools in which um, this topology book was born, right, in Italy, 
maybe the stuff I'm going over right now is commonplace in the prerequisite material, and so covering this kind of analysis on matrices would perhaps be a little bit out of place in the topology course in Italy, perhaps. I don't know, just speculating. Anyway, so um, lemma 4.57, let G be a topological group with identity E, then G is Hausdorff if and only if the singleton containing the identity is closed. So we know that if, if a space is Hausdorff, it implies that the singletons are closed. We've, we've talked about that before. This is interesting because this says that if that, if the identity, if that one singleton set, the identity set, is closed, that implies that all the other singletons are closed. There's this sort of homogeneity in a group, that what happens at the identity happens everywhere. That's kind of the intuition behind this lemma. And um, so, as I was just saying, G is Hausdorff, then E is closed, since all singleton sets in a Hausdorff space are closed. You can see lemma 3.67, in fact, all finite subsets of a Hausdorff space are closed, so singletons are kind of the most dramatic, um, nearly the most dramatic finite subset, right? I guess the empty set's the most, empty set's got nothing in it, that's about the finitest thing you can get, right? Um, I don't know, but anyway, conversely, suppose that the identity singleton's closed, then you can study the map phi from g cross g to g, given by the multiplication um, x, y inverse. And if you look at this, you can see that that's the composite of left, um, let's see here, so left multiplication composed with pi 1, composed with right multiplication with pi 2 inverse, where I'm saying pi 1 of x comma y is equal to x, and pi 2 of x comma y is equal to y, so, lo and behold, phi is the continuous of compo compo compositive continuous maps and is therefore continuous. Moreover, if you look at it, um, phi is equal to E if and only if x, y inverse is equal to E, which is to say x equal to y. What does that mean? Oh, well then the inverse image of the identity is exactly the diagonal in the Cartesian product of G and G, right? But G was Hausdorff, right? which means that the diagonal is closed. Remember that trick? The diagonal of a Hausdorff space is closed. So, therefore, di the diagonal is closed, which implies... Um, oh, I'm, I'm bad. It was if and only if, right? So... <sighs> I'm a dummy. So, we this proves that the uh, diagonal is closed, because we have a continuous inverse of a closed set, right? Singleton's closed. So, that said... Um, so continuous inverse of the we're, we're assuming it's closed because that was assumed here in the converse direction, right? Um, so continuous inverse closed set is closed, but the continuous inverse is also the diagonal. So the diagonal is closed, but then that implies that G is Hausdorff since it, G is Hausdorff if and only if the diagonal is closed, um, since G is a topological space, of course. And, 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 and consequently, the space is Hausdorff. You can see page th th uh, theorem 3.69, uh, page 60 of Minetti for that. All right, so anyway, to summarize what's going on here, and this, uh, this, this use of the diagonal, it is, it, it, it continues to astound me, this, this, this argument. Like, I it just, I, I don't feel like in a million years I would have thought of that. And like, the things it cuts through, like, like, like butter, you know? Hmm. But anyway, as I was saying at the start of all this, the existence of the left-right multiplication maps on G means that whatever happens at the identity happens everywhere. And um, I think this is interesting because similar things happen for a Lie group, which is a group, of course, which is also manifold, and the group operations are smooth. So essentially, like, you can prove things about tangent vector, like the, uh, the, the Lie, so-called Lie bracket of vector fields at the identity, and what happens there, <laughs> it, it gets transported all over the place. Um, because the left multiplication maps then, through differentiation, induce um, like push forward maps. And when your map is um, invertible, then the push forward also has a. It, well, you can push it both ways because you got the inverse map. And anyway, there's all, all kinds of really neat um, structure to explore in a Lie group, right? But so here's our examples of topological groups. And well, spoiler alert, most of these are Lie groups as well. Um, matrix group is really sort of the. Uh, the entry-level example of Lie groups. Now, Lie groups don't have to be matrix groups, but many of the Lie groups which are interesting happen to be matrix groups. 
But to start with, think of them as topological groups. So we start with that structure, and then, you know, once you know about manifolds, you can go past that. Um, anyway, so you got your general linear group, your special linear group, your special orthogonal matrix group, your general linear group over complex number, complex matrices, you know, general, invertible complex n by n matrices, um, determinant one complex matrices. You got your unitary group, which is n by n complex matrices that satisfy this a dagger a equals to the identity. Here are the daggers, the Hermitian joint, it's the conjugate transpose of a. And then you've got your special unitary matrices, which are both unitary and determinant one. All right, so the um, SUN, especially SU2, is of deep importance to physics because it has much to do with the story of spin or, or also weirder stuff like isospin. Um, in fact, like the standard model physics is built from exactly this kind of representations of these kinds of groups. You might... Well, what's a group representation? A group representation is a uh, like a homomorphism from one of these groups to a vector space. The vector space actually has this this the states, um, which you know comes to us from quantum mechanics. And so, the way the group enters the story for physics is a little bit interesting, and it involves what's called group representation theory. But before you can understand group representation theory, you probably should understand what the group is, I guess. Um, but anyway, and uh, group representation theory, if, if you wanted a quick explanation for what that is, that's kind of like taking group theory and doing linear algebra over it, roughly speaking. It's like adding linear algebra to group theory, some, something like that. But... Um, Anyway, so all of the matrix groups above are subspaces of Rn squared or Cn squared, which is to say we're identifying Rn by n by just stringing out the entries as an n squared vector or Cn by n by stringing out the vector entries as a Cn squared vector. And as such, they're subsets of Euclidean space and, and, and therefore are metrizable and, and hence Hausdorff. And uh, in fact, GLn plus, which is half of the GL, the general linear group over R, is the half with positive determinant. Well, this is, is, is actually connected, and, and you can also prove that GLNC is connected, although Minetti does not do that, neither do I. <laughs> claims, claims are made that the proof is very similar to GLN plus, GL plus NR, um, and yes, such, such sentences can be written, but can students actually supply the proof that this is connected? I do wonder that. I do wonder that, indeed. <laughs> I'm not, like, making some kind of foreboding, foreboding comment about your next test. I'm really just asking, do you really know how you would prove? I'm, I wonder if once you look at this proof that GLN plus is connected, I wonder if you'd actually be able to prove it for this, the, the complex case. I, 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 I don't think everybody is able to do that. I don't think it's as obvious as it's, is claimed in the book, but... Um, Listen, if you want to read a lot more about matrix groups, there's a there's a wonderful little book by um, TAPP, T-A-P-P, uh, Matrix Groups for Undergraduates. And um, it's about, I don't know, 100, 150 pages long, something like that, one of those little AMS books. Very nice. I've taught a mini course out of that before. You can find videos, I think, at the end of my elementary differential geometry series. And in there, um, he studies the... Well, yeah, the topology of the matrix groups, but he he does more. He eventually builds his way to looking at these things called maximal tori. Um, there's some kind of maximal torus in some of these, and how that appears, and what that has to do with the story of rotations and such. It's 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 interesting, but um, well, let me get back on track here. So, how do we prove GLN plus? Um, I'm just trying to say, there's a lot of books written about matrix groups. You can you can look up much more about these things if you want to read more. Um, it's also the book by Miller, if I remember right, is good. All right, focus, focus. Induction, so we're going to prove this by induction on n. Base case, n equals to 1. Notice that GL plus 1R, <laughs> my dog's head, like, enough neighbor dogs, like, enough math already. Um, GL plus 1R is, what's that? 
uh, a an element of r. Oh, one by one. I was like, I was reading that as like the absolute value of x. I'm like, why am I putting r to the absolute value of x? No, one by one. Um, so, yeah, that's connected because, well, zero to infinity is connected. Great. So suppose inductively that um, n is greater than 1, and suppose that gl plus n minus 1 is connected. All right. Then we're going to do some really kind of sneaky stuff here, so let's get to it. Column 1, um, from rn cross n to r, defined by the column 1 map, right, um, is that. And you can look at our n by n as our n cross our n by n minus 1, basically like peel off the first column, and you can look at our n cross n as a Cartesian product of our n with that. And then in that context, the column 1 map, it could be understood as the projection onto the first factor, right? And as such, it's a projection 1 map, therefore it is continuous, and it is in fact open. And as such, you can restrict it to the GLN plus um, space, and um, since that's an open subset, you can restrict this continuous map to an open subset and get the restrictions continuous and also open. And um, so that means that column 1 acting on GL plus NR is in fact RN with 0 removed. Um, that's not entirely obvious. Let me kind of explain why that's true. Okay, so clearly zero can't be in there, because if you have zeros in your matrix, then the matrix is not invertible, all right? So suppose um, V1 is not equal to zero, right? Take any V1 not equal to zero, then we can continue V1 to a basis, V1, V2, da 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 Vn for Rn, and note that this matrix has column one equal to V1, and therefore, the column 1 map is onto Rn with 0 deleted. So, um, Audric, this is the uh, argument that I could not think of. Like, last semester, we were trying to prove that, like, matrix map was onto or something. I think this is exactly the argument I couldn't think of. And then I, uh, I was talking to Bill in the car on the way back, and he told me, and then I, I just never found the time or space to tell you about it again. But here it is. <laughs> so, better late than never. This kind of extend to a basis argument is very sneaky, and we'll use it again here. But um, so this proves that the column one map is a surjection onto onto that space for what it's worth. All right, then what? Then what? All right, so then continuing, Menetti claim Menetti claims in a slightly different notation, mind you, that um, the fibers of column one map. Um, suitably restricted. I mean, this is, technically speaking, I should, I mean, if I was really fussy, I would use like a tilde over it, because it's the restriction of the column 1 map to GLN plus, right? But uh, I'm going to follow Manetti's lead and not use a modified notation for the restriction of standard maps, because it's clear in my writing that I'm looking at the restriction of it from writing this, all right? Okay, so anyway, um, the fibers of this map are connected then, with the help of lemma 4.18, remember? Um, what was lemma 4.18? Oh, goodness. Let me look it up. It's been a bit. Alright, lemma 4.18. Which one's that? One moment. Here we go. Let y be a... Where was I? Let y be a topolo connected topological space, f mapping from x to y continuous, onto such that f inverse y is connected for every y in y, then if f is open or closed, x is connected. All right, so we're applying that here to the column 1 map. The <coughs> excuse me. Um, Now, we haven't proved yet that the fibers of column 1 map are connected yet, all right? If we had proved that, then since um, the rest of this data satisfies the lemma 4.18, then the, the, the punchline of lemma 4.18 is that the domain is connected. That would then prove GLNR is connected, all right? So 
let's 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 work on showing the fibers. Uh, let's let's study the fibers of GLN plus the column one map. All right. So one of the things that we should notice is that let's scooch this up a bit here. Um, if we look at the inverse image under the column one map of of E one one zero 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 zero, right? Then you're looking at um, any matrix, invertible matrix, right? Such that you got one, like the um, E one in the first column, and then vectors, right? And um, another way you could say that is you've got A equals to E one V two da 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 V n, and the determinant of A is positive, right? This is just a quick, same thing. Um, you could then rewrite that because of the way determinants work um, because this is one zero 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 that's by the you know you've got a by the way determin property determinants that's the determinant of one times the determinant of the this n minus one by n minus one block which I'm going to call v2 bar v3 bar da, 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 the n bar so here I'm just giving um, these vectors a haircut so to speak I'm I'm just cutting the top of their heads right off Ooh, that sounds kind of violent um, anyway you get the idea buzz cut and um, so same same compo same n minus one components, but just cut the top off it. And um, I claim that in fact this is homeomorphic to GLN GL plus n minus one R, where the homeomorphism is the map A maps to um, this A here. All right, maps to v two bar v three bar da 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 v n bar which is arguably one to one and on to and is clearly continuous because all it involves is just selecting a submatrix which is just basically a projection map which is continuous and it is surjective and so continuous surjective one to one um, and so by induction claim by induction claim we have then that the um, this is connected right therefore that's connected so we've got at least that the uh, the fiber over E1 is connected, right? Next, we show that all of the fibers. Next, we show that all of the fibers of the column one map are homeomorphic. All right. So here's how that goes. Let y be a non-zero vector in Rn. Then, column one is um, the inverse image of. Um, the non-zero vector into the column one map is clearly non-empty because you could just it's again you could use you know take start with y and extend y to a basis then that matrix has column one as its y all right so all right so anyway hence let a be a matrix for which the column one of a is equal to y now remember the um, this property of matrix multiplication the column one of the product is um, a times column one of the the right factor that's from this down here so if you have a b times a and then column one column two dot column n the way that multiplies is um make sure you can see it the way that multiplies is a go to b1 a to b2 a to bn right so if we look at column one here and over here we can see that column one of a b is a times column one of b all right so that means that if we looked at left multiplication by A, um, the um, inverse image of the E1, all right, remember column, so <laughs> column one of A is Y, then when I multiply A, well, this is equal to column one inverse of y, which implies that column 1 inverse of y is connected since LA is a homeomorphism, right? And we knew that this is connected by the induction hypothesis. Um, all right. Sorry, this was clear to me when I wrote it. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else to say here. Um, all 
All right, so let me, let me move on here. Sorry if there's a gap there. I don't, I'm trying to be explicit here. I think I have, if there's a gap there, I think I filled that same sort of gap a little bit later. So let's just go on. Um, next up, um, claim. Oh, by the way, so then induction finishes the proof back there. So we, we, we've, We've, we've proved that, you know, uh, the fiber is connected and therefore going back to lemma 4.18, that implies that GLN R is connected. So assuming it for N minus 1 implies it for N. Therefore, by proof by mathematical induction, GLN plus R is connected. Next up, corollary 4.59, SLNR, SLNC are connected and GLNR has two connected components. Here's the proof. GLN pl uh, GL plus NR we proved is connected. And we assume the same can be shown for GLNC. Notice that there's this really neat map. You can just take psi from GLN plus NR to SLN defined as such. Psi of A is equal to take the column 1, divide by determinant A, and like that. If you take the determinant of this, by multilinearity of the determinant, the determinant of A factors out, and then you get determinant of 1 over determinant of A times determinant of A. So when you take the determinant of psi A, you get 1, which means that this map is really into that. And it's also... It gives, I said, gives a homeomorphism, then I was like, ooh, no. That's not a homeomorphism. There's, there's lots of, lots of different matrices over here, which would give this same matrix, um, I think. Um, like, well, anyway, it's not, it's not a homeomorphism, but it is continuous and on to. Um, this set is smaller than that one. It can't be bijective in that sense, but... Um, well, let's see here. In terms of, like, manifold dimension, this is an n-squared dimensional open set, an rn squared, so to speak, and this has, this has one less dimension. This is n-squared minus 1 because you've got the determinate condition. You've reduced the degree of freedom over here. They can't be, there can't be a continuous um, bijection between those two things, not, not, not like this anyway. Okay, so, all right, so, 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 uh, so this is a continuous and onto mapping, and likewise, you can define phi by the same trick for the complex case, and so SLNR and SLNC are the continuous image of connected sets, therefore, they're connected. That's theorem 4.7, in case you forgot. And um, to see GLN is GLN plus union GLN minus, where GLN minus is the negative determinant, you can just notice that GLN plus is the determinant, the inverse image of zero to infinity, whereas GLN minus is the inverse image of minus infinity to zero, and those are therefore both open. And um, you can also see that if you have a negative determinant matrix B, and of, of which there are many, right, then left multiplication by B will take you from GLN plus to GLN minus, and since that's a homeomorphism, the fact that GLN plus was connected implies that GLN minus is connected. And so the corollary follows. All right. So that's pretty nice. This, this is, you know, a lot easier than, a lot, a lot, um, a much easier lift than the last page. <laughs> um, and then there's this part of the lecture. Here we go. <sighs> uh, here we go. Lemma 4.60, let f be continuous and onto from compact set x to a connected y, and y is also Hausdorff, if all of the fibers of um, f are connected, then x is connected. This is a lemma we need. The proof of that is by a couple of corollaries and lemmas we had from before. Corollary 4.52 said that if you have f from x to y with x compact and y Hausdorff, that means that f is a closed map. So in that context, then, we can apply lemma 4.18, because it's closed map, from a what? From a compact space to a Hausdorff space. And if it's continuous, closed, and the, um, and the fibers are connected, then that implies X is connected, right? We just use that for the last connected proof, right? That was the linchpin of the induction, was the uh, lemma 4.18. So here we go. Proposition. So we're going to use that lemma 4.60 I just scrolled up, right? Lemma proposition. 
this really feels more like a theorem, but anyway, proposition. The topological groups, S-O-N, U-N-C, U-N-C, don't care for that, um, special unitary group of n by n complex matrices, they're S-O-N better, are compact and connected. So S-O-N, which is all we're actually going to prove, we're just going to prove S-O-N, R is compact and connected, and allegedly the proof of the other two are similar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Probably, maybe they are. Okay, so um, consider the map F from n by n matrices to n by n matrices cross R given by F maps from A to A transpose A comma determinant A, right? So if, if A is in SONR, that's going to make this equal to the identity matrix, and it's going to make this equal to 1. So... Now, I think it's clear that F is continuous because of the things we've talked about before. This is polynomial in the entries of the matrix A, as is that. So it's a multivariate polynomial, and as such, is continuous. Um, and the inverse image of the identity in the number 1 is straight up this set, but that's nothing more than SON R. All right, so great. So SONR is the continuous inverse, continuous inverse image of a singleton in a Hausdorff space. Therefore, SONR is a closed subspace. Um, it's a closed subspace of Rn by n. Furthermore, um, I would remind you that A transpose A is ev equal to this formula, but that is the same as this, which is really the dot product of column I of A with column J of A, and by assumption A transpose A is equal to the identity matrix, the ijth component of the identity matrix is the Kronecker delta IJ. This says that the dot product of I column I with column J is equal to 1 if they're equal and 0 if they're not. That is to say that they have, that they're all perpendicular or orthogonal to one another, and that they all have length 1 because like column i dot column i is 1, which is to say that the length of column i squared with respect to the Euclidean norm is 1. So, lo and behold, the length of each column vector is 1 in Euclidean distant Euclidean norm. And, by the way, the length of the matrix squared is the length is the sum of the squares of the lengths of the column squared. Each one of these being n, we get the length of the matrix squared is n. Which then says, since this was an arbitrary matrix in SON, arbitrary matrix in SON is at most distance square root of n from the origin. So that means that SONR is bounded in Rn squared. So what do we got? We've got a closed and bounded subset of Rn squared, therefore SONR is compact. Woohoo! Well, that actually wasn't too bad. Showing it's compact is plausibly a test question, right? I mean, it's not without, with some hand-holding, like, this is, you know, eh, it's, it's not crazy for a decent, like, a, a well-crafted test could, could test this, I think. It remains to show connectedness. The connectedness argument is more nuanced. Here we go. So, proof continued. We've proved it's con connect, uh, con compact. It remains to show it's connected. So, um, Minetti introduces P from SON to the n minus 1 sphere, defined by P of A is column 1 of A. Now, that makes sense because we just proved that every column in A has length 1, which means that it's in, it's an n-dimensional vector with length 1, which is, means it's, it's in SN minus 1. For example, S2 is the set of three-dimensional vectors whose length is 1, right? Um, so that's a well-stated map because we just proved the length of column 1 of A is 1. And, um, and in fact, the matrix identity for multiplication column by column states that column 1 of AB is A column 1 of B. And then in terms of the P notation, that means that P of AB is A P of B. Thus, Manetti claims that LA of the fiber of P over V is the fiber over P of fiber of P over A V? Um, I don't think that's entirely. I mean, maybe it's obvious if you have the right way of thinking about it. But I thought students probably want to see proof that that's true. So here's the proof. Do, 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 do.
So P inverse of AB is B such that P of B is AV. That's B and SON such that column 1 of B is equal to AV. So there's, I'm just working on P inverse of AV. All right, there we go. P inverse of V, on the other hand, is, let's say, B bar. Not to be confused with Babar, but something else. Um, I guess there's a, ra a raccoon in the neighbor's backyard or something. I don't know. Something, something controversial over there with the dogs. Who let the dogs out? I don't know. Let's see here. Oh, my neighbor did every day. It's all good. They're good dogs. P inverse of V is B bar, an SON, such that column one of B bar is V. Okay, great. So what is LA of P inverse of V? This would be LA of B bar, such that column one of B bar is V, and B bar is an SONR. But this is exactly A B bar, such that column one of B bar is V, and B bar is an SONR. Baby steps, baby steps, sorry. But a times column 1 of B bar is AV yields that column 1 of AB bar is equal to AV. Thus, LA of P inverse V uh, is equal to AB bar such that column 1 of AB bar is equal to AV, such that B is in this. But then if you just re-index this set by noticing that we can put B equal to AB bar, and there's something a little bit something a little bit sneaky here, because we're trading B bar over S O N for B over S O N. I believe we're using like a transitivity of the group argument here to like relabel the relabel the sum over the group. There's something a little bit a little bit subtle going on here, but there it is. Um, B such that column one of B is equal to A V, but this is exactly how we had described way back up here. P inverse of, of, of AV, right? So this set is equal to that set, which is what Minetti claimed, right? So there you go, that's true. Moving along. <clears throat> so, all right. Um, so continuing with the proof that SONR is connected. We found that LA of the fiber over V of P over V of the fiber of V over oh, good grief. The fiber of P over V, the image under A, is is equal to the fiber over it's equal to P inverse of A V. There we go. Stop jibber jabbering. So what this means is that the fiber of A V is homeomorphic to the fiber of V. Um, because LA is a homeomorphism, right? And so, what does that give us? Well, number one, if since v and, and s n minus one, uh, if we take v and s minus one, we can complete it to an orthonormal basis by the Gram-Schmidt algorithm. If you know what that is, but you can take a a, a a normalized vector and you can orthonormalizely orthonormally extend it to a basis for R n by Gram-Schmidt algorithm, and um, and then either the determinant's minus one to start with, and you can swap to and get determinant one, or it comes to you with the determinant one. Without loss of generality, we can assume that these form a right-handed basis in the sense that the determinant of the matrix by which they're concatenated is giving you determinant one. Um, in dimension three, that means the right-hand rule applies. The cross product of the first two is the, in the direction of the third one. But in higher dimensions, right-handedness is measured by the determinant or you can think of it in terms of positively oriented volumes and such, but anyway, relabel if needed, construct A is equal to V, V2, da 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 Vn, and by construction, A transpose A is I, determinant of A is 1, and P of A is going to be column 1 of A, which is V. Now, V was arbitrary, so we can we can take any vector, any point, rather, in S minus, Sn minus 1, and we can find a matrix which takes that as its first column, in SOM, okay? Step number one. Step number two, if we look at uh, the inverse image of this, well, that's column one being one, and then we've got W and B over here, right? But this being an SONR, it turns out to force W to be zero because of this calculation, all right? Because if, if the determinant of this is one, 
Well, that gives us the determinant of b is 1. That's good. But it also gives us that this transpose times itself is equal to the identity matrix. But when you do this, do the block multiplication, you end up with w up here, w transpose down here, and w transpose w plus b transpose b down here. But this and that must be 0. So w is 0, which means that this 1 is equal to 1, great. b transpose b is equal to the n minus 1 identity. Hey, well that means that b is actually an son minus, an son minus 1 r, which is pretty neat, because then we find that the fiber over E1 is exactly this set, which is really homeomorphic to son, right? It's technically not son minus 1, but, you know, come on, you can just map this to b, and then that's a homeomorphism. So then... So then, continuing the proof that S O N R is connected, we let V be a point in S N minus 1. We construct A as in number 1 of page 12. So A E 1 is column 1 of A is V. But then we notice that L A of P inverse of E 1 is P inverse of A E 1. And what that means then is that L A of this, which was homeomorphic clearly to S O N minus 1 R, is equal to the inverse image of the column 1 map of V, which means that all fibers of P are homeomorphic to SO n minus 1 R. Ah, well that's interesting. So, notice then that P from SO n comma R to SN minus 1 is an onto continuous map from compact SO n R to SN minus 1, which we know is connected in Hausdorff by that previous Wallace theorem lecture, and so if we can prove that all the fibers of P are connected, then lemma 4.60 gives the, the domain of P, which is SONR, is connected. So we proceed by induction on N. Number 1, SO1R, which is just this singleton 1, well that's connected, and then if we suppose that SON minus 1R is connected for some N, greater than 1, then by the arguments of pages 10 through 13, we find that SONR is connected since the induction hypothesis implies that all the, the fibers of P are connected. Hence, lemma 4.60 applies, and we can conclude that SONR is connected. That is a lot of steps. <laughs> so anyway, there, there it is. There's the proof that SONR is connected. I, I think this is, uh, I'm pretty sure this is the most technical thing I've done so far this semester for this class. Um, I don't know. I like it. It's interesting. Got all kinds of matrix stuff in it, you know, and uh, I don't know. I feel like I actually added something here because I don't think that, I don't think this is at all clear. I mean, it's easy enough to write this formula down, but you understand why it's true? Um, I don't know. Anyway, folks, that is all I got on matrix groups for now, so I think um, what comes next? Let's see here. I think I'm going to go next to uh, Chapter 5 on topological quotients. There is a section on exhaustions by compact sets. I think I don't have... I'm not sure if I have anything to say about that this semester. You know, I would encourage you to read this exhaustion by compact sets um, if you're interested. It is, he does, he does have the one-point compactification um, in there, but I don't know. I, if I remember right, I don't think there was any homework that I thought was especially interesting, so I kind of like, eh, I'm just going to go on to, to a topological quotient. So I think we're on to Chapter 5 next time. Anyway, thanks guys.